My name is Jennifer Chapin. I'm with the City of Orlando's Office of Communications and Neighborhood Relations. I'm a neighborhood resource specialist. Many of you know me already. Um, also with us from our office this evening is Cindy Light, who is our neighborhood resources or our neighborhood relations supervisor. Um, so on the neighborhood relations team, um, for those of you who are familiar with our office, we have several different types of trainings that we schedule regularly throughout the year. We have a monthly workshop series called Community Connections. Our next workshop is this Saturday and we'll be talking about legislative updates. Uh, we have a spring workshop series called uh, I Lead, uh, which is a series where we develop several different types of guides initially. And um, yeah. we wanted things available to people who were not able to attend evening trainings or trainings on Saturdays. Um, so we created about, we have about 25 different guides on Orlando.gov slash neighborhoods. Um, a couple of guides that we have available that might be good for mandatory associations um, are city resources for mandatory neighborhood organizations and parliamentary procedures made simple. And then we also do, um, we also do um, specialized board trainings for people who reach out and say, we have this problem with our neighborhood organization. Can you come talk to us about this? So about five or six weeks ago, one of our neighborhood leaders, uh, who is actually with us this evening, reached out to us and said, you know, we, um, we had to raise our condo monthly maintenance fees last year by nearly $100 a month to help help cover insurance and we're a little concerned that we might have to do that again for next year so one thing that we would like to do if it's possible neighborhood relations team can you bring together people to for us to have a neighborhood sort of a round table discussion to talk about um what what are people doing to help cover the cost of rising um, insurance. So that's what we wanted to do this evening. Um, we just wanted to have a conversation with people. What are you doing? Um, I wonder what would work for my neighborhood, uh, sorts of conversations. This isn't, you know, this may or may not be a conversation where you can walk away with a, with a, um, specific solution for your neighborhood, but you might hear what other people are talking about. So um, one of the facilitators this evening is a, one of our other neighborhood leaders, Dean Garrow, who also happens to be a community association manager. And he has done uh, a great uh, workshop for us in the past at our annual neighborhood and community summit where he talks about fiduciary responsibilities. And so he's gonna um, take things off for us. And um, when we get to a point where we can start uh, asking questions and offering advice, let, let's maybe just either hit the, um, hit the raise hand button, uh, either physically raise your hand, leave a, leave a note in the chat section, uh, and then we will go from there. Um, and we can take up as much of the two hours as we want, or if we finish before them, that's fine too. So okay. Dean, thanks. Okay, um, I, what I'm gonna do right now is we're gonna do this in two parts. The first part is I brought a couple of friends of mine that are insurance experts, because I think it's important for you, if you wanna know where you're going, it's important to know how you got to where you're standing right now. And so what, what we're gonna talk about is how we got to this point where insurance is like this. We're not going to offer you any solutions, um, but I a lot of people have questions because your 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 community is going to be asking you. They're going to be asking you as neighborhood leaders, why is our insurance going up so high? 
And I'm hoping to give you some of those answers. And then after these guys are done, we'll give a little, um, they have to, they're going to do the first part of this. They're going to have a, a Q and a session. You can ask some questions and then let's talk as community leaders. And I can share maybe some of the things that I've done and you can share what you've done. And, and we'll, Again, we, nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody's going to be able to give you definitive answers, but let's share our combined knowledge and our combined experience. So right now what I'll do is I'll turn it over to either Kevin or Jared, whoever wants to talk first, and let's let's talk about how we got here. Um, and the other things that before you start, I just want to make sure that if you can give us an indication of what you're seeing as far as, because one of the things people are asking is, how much? How much is it going up? And I know every association is different. Every you know, every building is different. Every community is different. But, but you know, it's one of the things that I know you're going to get asked, so I'm just going to warn you right off the bat. All right? So okay. I'll turn it over to whoever wants to talk first. All right. Um, I guess I guess I'll, I'll uh, lead off the um, kind of how we got to where we are. That's a uh, that's that's a lot of years packed into uh, what I'll do as a brief overview. Um, but, you know, Memories are memories are usually short, so uh, we can go back to like the 2004-2005 storms. Uh, really, after those storms, we saw a drastic increase in premiums, uh, and then from there, we started to see a uh, a decrease. Probably what around like 2010, right, Jared? Uh, we started right. to see premiums coming back down from that huge increase, and that stemmed from those. Uh, if you remember, we had the three storms and one hurricane season. Um, and so that that really uh, turned everything upside down. But this problem, uh, while it does have something to do with storms, uh, really initiated starting back uh, over a decade ago uh, where we had um, exploitation is what I'll what I'll call it by. Um, there are a lot of great contractors. There are a lot of great attorneys. There are a lot of great public adjusters, uh, but there's also a lot of bad ones. Um, and so when you have uh, a group of people, uh, you may have heard uh, the phrase assignment of benefits used uh, and things like that. And you have uh, a lot of different uh, parties somewhat exploiting a system that was open to it. So insurance companies, and while they're not uh, while the insurance companies at that point in time uh, were not um, were were not technically just absolved from from any responsibility because maybe they were denying claims and opened that door for some of these individuals to come in and start exploiting that system. So for about seven years, there was mainly just that contract, you know, contractor, uh, public adjuster and uh, attorneys getting involved in the claims process. That increased the claims values drastically. Um, and so you didn't like the answer the insurance company gave you. You hired one of these individuals through assignment of benefits, through uh, a public adjuster agreement, or hired an attorney to fight uh, the, the insurance company. That elevated claims significantly. But we didn't hear a lot about that in the news, and we still saw uh, a, a almost um, flat or uh, very, you know, nothing substantial as far as increases go. Um, and so it was manageable uh, for about seven years. What the insurance industry couldn't take is both that situation and the storms. Well, what happened in 2017? Hurricane Irma hit, which was a huge devastating storm. And from that period on, you had you, we've had more storms in the past five or six years than historically we have had um, you know, each and every year. So what insurance companies had at that point is a real problem uh, of both a uh, exploitation issue, as well as an actual catastrophic claims issue. And when you put those two things together simultaneously happening, that's why you you it al almost uh, created a pot boiling over situation. And that's why we've had these 100%, 200%, 300% uh, in some situations increases on 
property in the past uh, year, uh, especially in 2023, is because it all kind of came to a head and uh, where we had major issues from uh, different players in the marketplace. And then that co was compounded by an overly active storms, uh, you know, storm seasons, uh, as we have looked at the past five or six years. Uh, so in the past six years, you've had an industry that um, has been uh, not profitable, uh, just like any business, businesses like being profitable. So when that happened, they started increasing rates more exponentially at a, at a larger clip. So you started seeing those 20, 30, 40, 50% increases year over year uh, since that, since about 2018, they've been uh, going up at that uh, relatively larger clip. And then 2023 hit. Um, and in 2022, we started to see some more of those exponential increases but 2023 hit and took us all by surprise. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the reinsurance market uh, and capacity issues. So just like a lot of different industries, insurance is uh, heavily regulated, but it's also heavily supported by reinsurers, which are investors that in invest in uh, the insurance market and provide insurance to insurance companies. When those rates go up or they limit what they're willing to give to insurance companies, then you have supply and demand issues. And that's another reason why you've seen those rates exponentially increase. So uh, that gives, you know, kind of a brief and a lot of information packed into uh, a, a brief summary there of what, how we've gotten to this point. It's a number of reasons, but that gives you uh, a, a quick summary to kind of uh, bite into and maybe ask some other questions, but Jared may want to add to some of those points uh, just that I briefly uh, touched on there. Yeah, so I, I like that Kevin started back in 2004. It seems like it was so long ago, but these insurance companies, they operate as if they're going to exist forever. They operate on 100, 200 year timelines. Uh, some of them have been around that long already. Um, so going back to 2004, like Kevin said, we saw that spike or uh, I'd say yeah, it was a solid decade almost of increases. So at that point, we hadn't had any storms. So the companies were all fat and happy, right? Very profitable. The reserves were stacked with cash. They were comfortable. So when the companies that were in Florida uh, or when the companies that weren't in Florida, rather, saw how comfortable and profitable the companies in Florida were, they decided they wanted a piece of it. Uh, new companies sprouted out of thin air in Florida, uh, Florida domiciled insurance companies. This is just to add to Kevin's timeline that he already gave you. Just another little factor. Those newcomers came in and started chopping rates. Uh, when I first started in the industry, it was, it was around that time. Uh, 12 years ago, uh, we started seeing uh, a soft market. So you would go out to bid or to shop your policies, and nine times out of 10, you would see a flat renewal or maybe even a decrease in premium, which I can't even uh, imagine these days. You would see a decrease. And this was because those newcomers to the state were cutting rate to win, or as we call it, buy business. We want that account we're going to cut the rate by X amount of dollars. We're going to beat the incumbent company and we're going to keep beating them as long as we can. What happens is the other companies that were already in Florida, even the excess and surplus lines carriers, decide that they need to compete or rather they have to compete. So they start dropping their rates. And remember, these are when times are good. They just came off a very prof profitable decade or so. Still no serious storms leading all the way up to 2017 with Irma. Still making money. All of a sudden, after years of, of putting these very inexpensive policies out there for buildings that would be quite expensive to replace, then all of a sudden we get hit with a storm. They've shrunk their margins over the years. Yes, their reserves may be healthy, but the premium doesn't match the risk. 
So while we all enjoyed those low, low premiums for a handful of years, several years rather, it's a, it's, it was a detriment to the market as a whole. It put these carriers in a position to where while the reserves were still strong, they could only handle one or two big catastrophic events hitting the state before their reserves were a little thinner. And then guess what happens? Their profit margin is going to stay the same. If, they're, if they've agreed on making X on property, property type A and B, they're going to make X on property type A and B, regardless of how much they have to raise the premium. So I'm carrier A and I have to make a certain profit. Our reserves just took a big hit from Irma. We've got to jump these premiums to a certain point to where our margins are healthy again and our reserves can build up over the next five, 10 year timeline. So over, over that six, seven year period when premiums were just falling out of the sky low, they have to correct that. So while we enjoyed it, it put us all in a much worse position. And when I say, oh, I mean, Floridians, not me as an insurance agent, it puts us in a bad position because now the carriers are playing catch up. Okay. That's why we're seeing these completely unrealistic and unpredictable increases. It doesn't seem like it makes sense because it doesn't. They're playing catch up because they got too cocky, if you will, with their pricing to win business when times were good and the storms weren't hitting us. Now we're in that period of, of heavy correction where we were already in a bad spot, premiums were too low. Then we get hit with a storm, then another storm, then another storm. And, and we're, we're in a spot where carriers are going insolvent, going out of business. We've lost three or four. Uh, carriers are tightening their underwriting requirements. They're offering, uh, they're not offering these lower deductibles we've seen over the years. They're applying actual cash value provisions to policies versus replacement costs, meaning they will replace your roof, but they will depreciate it based on how old it is. Right. So if it's a 25 year useful life sh asphalt shingle roof and it's 15 years old, they're gonna give you 10 years worth of, worth of, uh, of roof. They're not gonna pay for the whole roof. So they're gonna depreciate it based on the roof's uh, timeline, essentially. So it's it's getting it's getting ugly or it's gotten ugly. If we get through hurricane season this year unscathed or relatively unscathed, it'll give us some time to start this recovery and it'll give time for some of the legislative reform to take hold. Kevin mentioned assignment of benefits contracts with roofers, public adjusters, and then the uh, power of attorney with your lawyers that fight these claims. And like Kevin said, there are good people in all of those industries. They're necessary a lot of times. If you have a claim denied for all the wrong reasons, damn right you're going to want to fight that, you know, and, and that's all of our rights to do so. You know, we need to have that recourse and the ability to fight these insurance carriers. But it, it got a little bit out of hand. Claims that should have been denied are getting paid. Claims that should have been $5,000 turned into $25,000. And that's happening a few thousand times a day here in the state of Florida. So again, we pushed through this storm season. Hopefully Lee leaves us alone. It's a new tropical storm lingering out there. Uh, if we if we get through storm season unscathed, I feel mm -hmm. like we're gonna we're gonna have a, a some time to breathe and some time for the legislative reform, which includes um, neutering the powers of the assignment of benefits contracts making it more difficult for fraud to occur in our state, uh, which should which should give the carriers and all of us time to breathe and recover from this. Uh, unfortunately, the carriers are gonna be able to fill their pockets, which ultimately is good for all of us as Floridians, uh, because then we can start seeing a correction or a retracement in those premiums. It won't be quick, it will not be overnight. We're talking a year, maybe even two years of getting through storm seasons without catastrophic losses. Um, so we we have a question right off the bat from Rebecca, who is in uh, one of our um, city neighborhoods, obviously. Uh, Rebecca, you are still on mute. I can take so care I, of that real easily. <laughs> yes. Hi, Rebecca. 
Hi. Yeah. So, so you would agree that the environment as it is right now is unsustainable. So, um, let me just confirm that, that yes, you agree that the environment as it stands right now in the insurance market is unsustainable. Uh, and then as follow up, in the event, because the environment being what it is with more, uh, more storms, more storm damage, more, you know, storms are getting stronger and more frequent. In the event we do not get lucky and uh, are able to get that, you know, sort of breather in the next couple of years, what are other things that, that are being done to, uh, just trying to be realistic? That, I mean, Mother Nature is going to do what Mother Nature is going to do. And uh, I sat in on another insurance webinar last week where they explained it's not just about what happens in Florida, it's about weather patterns and catastrophic events worldwide that can manipulate the market. So I'm just really curious about, you know, if mother nature isn't going to cooperate, what is our, our recourse, particularly for our smaller communities? You know, because I mean, there's only so much people can do with inflation and cost of living, uh, but wages are not, you know, meeting the demand. I, I think I can give an answer to that, Rebecca. Um, you know, uh, yes, it does matter what's going on worldwide, but you have to understand that in Florida and, and Kevin or Jared, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, we have been paying for for the United States nationwide. We pay about 10 percent of the premiums across the country, but we represent over 80 percent of the claims. And that is exactly why the problem is centered on Florida. Yes. Insur the insurance crisis is all across the country, but Florida is particularly hard hit because, and what they were talking about, the assignment of benefits, shady um, contractors, that's what, that's how we got here. In, in my mind, that's that's a big part of why we got here. You know, when, when you have a business that you're paying 10% into, but you're paying out 80% um, of what you're taking in, uh, you know, that's that's a problem. And, um, and I agree with you. I think that it is a, a worldwide problem with climate change going on and everything else, but you know, the reason that we're in this pinch right now is, is I think, more Florida related. It's it's definitely a Florida problem, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I mean, it, it's it's kind of how our legal system in Florida it ha, has been, you know, built and uh, and used. I mean, we have two, we have some of the largest uh, attorney, you know, law firms and, and most attorneys in the, in the entire country. Um, and so to Dean's point, that's exactly right. So uh, so we have about 10% of the property premium in the entire country, but we represent 80% of the claims litigation. So that means uh, we are litigating more claims than almost the entire country combined. So uh, just to give you an idea, I read an article and uh, I'm not going to be perfect with this uh, statistic, but uh, but it's going to be close. I think it was uh, a study done in 2021 uh, where California had about 4,900 uh, or 5,000 litigated property claims, whereas at the same time frame, Florida had about 99 or 100,000 litigated property claims. California is a very litigious state as well. Uh, we always go back and forth on that, on who's the most litigious state uh, between Florida and California. Sometimes Texas and New York are thrown in there. But that really is a huge problem. When you look at, we are almost 20 times more likely to have a litigated property claim. And that's kind of our legal climate in Florida. So while it, it is an issue of climate change and there is an issue of of increased storm activity and it's a worldwide problem. That is a major problem uh, facing Florida and, and something that some of the legislation tried to address. And like Jared said, I mean, it's it's not gonna happen overnight, but uh, we do hope that that helps um, in, in the long run. Um, and, and so, but you're exactly right. I mean, in the first two quarters, I read an article where in the first two quarters, 
I mean, the convection storms and some of the winter storms that plagued the rest of the country, we didn't see a lot of that other than some hail storms and, and some flooding that we, that's, uh, you know, unseasonable, um, you know, here in Florida, but, uh, but we did see a, an increase in, in the billions of dollars from storms all over the rest of the world. So uh, as that feeds in, but uh, I do think that we're going to get to a point where the premiums uh, are sustainable, even with that climate change uh, issue and, and increased storm activity, whether that's whether that premium uh, adjustment or stabilization is where we're at today. I don't know, but I, I, I just I just think that that's going to get to a point where even if we have major storms, you know, increases in premium of. 100 200 percent i mean at that point if we have another ian in four or five years maybe premiums are at a level to sustain uh and not have to increase again a hundred percent so um i i don't know that we're going to see decreases anytime soon in the next year or two just while that stabilization occurs but but I think it is going to happen uh Jared I think you were going to add something to to that point as well yeah, again, I hate to keep going back to uh, in the history books uh, back to 2004 here, but that was a time where there was much less litigation and a market that made more sense from that standpoint. And if you look at the recovery made after 2004, and if you look at how high the rates jumped immediately after the 2004 storm season, in our terms, uh, rate-wise, just for easy math, the rates jumped up to $1 per $1,000 of insurable value. That was the top, uh, the, the highest they ever reached. We far surpassed that already, okay? Their recovery time was four years, which is pretty darn quick. So the rates didn't get as high as they are now, and they recovered strongly and rates dropped too much after four years in my opinion, because there was less of this litigation, the Morgan and Morgans of the world and the Dan Newlands and the Cohen laws, and those folks weren't as big and powerful back then. They were, they were more focused on workers' comp litigation and personal injury. Um, what happened with workers' comp was similar to what we're seeing in property insurance. These lawyers were, were laser focused on workers' comp litigation or workers' comp lawsuits. Workers' comp rates went through the roof, and it had much less to do with the injuries occurring. There wasn't any more injuries that year. It was that they were being heavily litigated, right? So take that and transfer it to what we're dealing with now to the property insurance market. They got rid of or they capped attorney fees on work comp claims back then, or, or around 2007 and 8. Guess what? All the lawyers found another niche. They left. The litigation went away and work comp premiums are the lowest they've ever been. They're, they're, you know, we get work comp renewals for our construction clients and things, and they're, they're dropping each year. We're getting dividends and money back and things like that. And I attribute that 90% to them capping the, what these attorneys could make. So instead of, oh yeah, I'm the attorney, I'll, I'll, I'll take that file. I'll take on that case. I don't even need to look into it. I'll take it. That's what's happening with the property market. Even if it's a loser of a case, they'll take it because they know that if they get offered by the carrier, the insurance carrier, $1 more than what the original offer was, or a dollar in general if the claim was denied, their attorney fees are covered 100% by the carrier. So well, one of the and Jared, general, just interrupt that. Now, the, another thing that I know that, that we haven't talked about, but wasn't there something about a multiplier if it was found that the insurance company acted in bad in, uh, in bad yeah. faith? And Correct. that meant that, that you, the attorneys would actually gain not just their attorney's fees, but a multiplier of their attorney's fees. Correct. And, and a, a big piece of, uh, of the, the bill that passed, I think, uh, what was it, November, uh, they eliminated one-way attorney's fees. So it gets rid of that multiplier. And it gets rid of the chance of the attorney having their fees covered if they get a dollar more than what the carrier originally offered. So I think we're I think we're gonna see, and Rebecca, to your question, I'm going to this is a really long answer, but I'm getting to it. Um, aside from the storms, if we get rid of all of that BS, 
and all of the, the claims that should have never been paid and all the litigation and fraud, these carriers have been insuring Florida for a hundred years. Yes, maybe storms are a little stronger and closer together, but we've always had bad storms. That, I don't know right. how many of y'all were here for Andrew and, you know, we've always had bad storms and we've never had this issue. I know Kevin will agree with me. If, if we eliminate the fraud and, and superfluous litigation that shouldn't have been happening in the first place, we can handle these storms. And when I said take a breather, it's just to catch up, to get back to zero. You know what I mean? Right. We're always going to have storms and yes, maybe they're going to get worse and closer together. But if we just get that little bit of a breather for the uh, reform to take hold and these litigators to calm down and find something else to do, I think we're going to be in a in a strong, pretty strong position because, uh, believe it or not, companies still want to invest in Florida insurance carriers. You know, they see dollar signs. You know, they they see a way to make a big profit. So people aren't going to be scared to throw money at these Florida insurance carriers as soon as they have a chance. Yeah, I mean, we just just this year, uh, from a commercial standpoint, so your condos uh, and and townhomes that insure like condos. Uh, We've had three ca three carriers uh, come into the come into the state just this year. So I mean, uh, people are seeing the increased premiums, and they're coming here, and nothing nothing drives premiums and better coverage more so than competition. So what now we're starting to see those carriers coming in, and that that's going to do so much if we can get rid of some of that. Uh, frivolous litigation, and we start seeing that competition, as Jared was saying, where they where they were buying business. Hopefully, it doesn't get to that extreme again. But but when when that competition starts coming in, you know, if you've had to go from a one percent deductible to a five percent deductible, you know, you may be able to get that back down. Uh, you may be able to start seeing improvements in premium, and that competition is where. Uh, a lot of that's going to come from and just seeing those carriers come in as we're kind of on this uh, verge of, of collapse, they're seeing they're they're seeing uh, some positive stuff going on in the state of Florida. And I think that that's uh, super encouraging for us all as, as Floridians. Um, so, I Jennifer, I think you have a question. Uh, yes, because I think we um, we had a you know, we had a conversation yesterday or the day before where we talked about sort of sh shopping around for insurance, so to speak. Is yep. that an, is, that's an option, is it? So we're brokers. Um, there isn't an insurance carrier in Florida that insures community associations that we do not represent. Um, we are not tied to any one company. We work for our clients. Uh, so we do the shopping for you. Uh, not all agents are created equal. Our department here at SILE, we specialize in community associations. That's all we do. Uh, we do some uh, construction stuff on the side, but 90% of our book of business is community associations. So when you say shop, a lot of folks think that, think, think that means different agents. Uh, but if you're with an agency that has every market at their fingertips, and they, they uh, do right by you and actually go out to market, and touch every single market possible to make sure that you're getting the best deal, um, that's all you really need to do. If, if your agent gives you bad service, that's a different story, you know, interview other agents. But in general, if you're with an agency that has all the markets available to them, uh, they're able to shop, shop for you. And, and it's an important thing to note, um, doesn't matter who your agent is or who your broker is, um, if you're curious as to where they came up with what they what they're presenting to you as the best quote, ask them for a market analysis. Ask they'll they'll give it to you. Ask them who they marketed it to. Who, because not all insurance carriers are created equal, and not all policies offered to the brokers and the insurers or the insurance agents are created equal. Um, you could be looking at a policy; it could be a lot cheaper than that thirty thousand dollars more than last year policy you're looking at, but. At the end of the day, if you start looking at a higher deductible, um, right. and that's one thing that we're going to be talking about um, in the next segment is be a, beware of those deductibles, that lions and tigers and bears, because oh if you go from a 1% deductible to a 50 or a 5% deductible, um, you may not understand that 
it's not a thousand dollar deductible or a five thousand or even a you know some people don't understand a deductible is not the amount of the claim the deductible in particular like say a condominium complex is the value of the entire property so i live in one that has 54 units they average three hundred thousand dollars a piece if you do the math it sure doesn't add up to 9.1 million dollars but that's what my property is valued at therefore if I have a 5% deductible, I'm looking at almost $500,000 divided between 54 people. That's pretty devastating. Yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Good. I was just agreeing. Uh, I, uh, we've got a couple of questions. I know that um, um, Alan's got his hand raised, but we also have a couple of questions in the meeting chat. Let me get to those really quickly. Sure. Kathy Curry has asked or has mentioned that um, their insurance increased 100% last year. We had an insurance appraisal completed recently, which raised our cost replacement from about $30,000 to probably $40,000. That alone will increase this year's policy between 35 and 40% from this year's cost. So I don't know if that's just a question or a comment. Uh, yeah, so um, I think it, it's... Um alluding to another problem that we've been seeing, especially since 2020, uh, increased costs of construction uh, since 2020 uh, because of the materials and labor and all of that stuff. Uh, so we've seen that and, and that compounds increases. Um, so when we've, we've had, you know, we've gotten people prepared for, uh, you know, 30 to 50% increases. Uh, so, you know, some of the, especially some of the newer condos, right. And like, we, we've been close, like I'm thinking of one condo in particular that, uh, you know, it was, uh, we prepared them for about a 40% increase and it came in, I think at 38%. It was great. Well, right around the same time they got a new appraisal. Well, they didn't have a new appraisal until their, their last appraisal was before COVID. So, before COVID, building materials were were down considerably. Construction costs were down considerably. So 38% came in below where we had them budgeting. But then when they when their costs increased by about 40%, their overall rating, their overall premium increase was about 75%. But a lot of that was coming from their increased costs uh, from you know to reconstruct because their uh, their values went up considerably. Um, so so that's that can compound that rate increase. So when we talk about percentage increases, usually it's just purely off of rate. Um, but that's but the, then the construction cost can compound that. Okay. And then one other question in the chat before we get to Alan because I see that he's got his hand hand yep. raised. Um, Jacqueline says, will you have any programs for the low income homeowners or will affordability not be a um, factor in premiums going forward? So um, unfortunately, so if we're talking condos, you're, you're pretty much stuck uh, with HOAs that are more driven by the liability premium or the general liability being the driving factor the slip and fall type coverage versus ensuring a condo structure, you're going to see, and Kevin and I are already seeing a leveling out in premiums. And I, I foresee a dip in premiums next year for those HOA clients. Uh, for the condos, unfortunately, there's really, there's really no way out of it until the market levels out. There are no grant programs. Uh, there are no uh, programs through the government or any private industry. Uh, that provide relief uh, for folks that are in a position that are they're struggling to pay their increased dues. We see it all the time, especially with our 55 and up type communities. A lot of folks on fixed income. Uh, and unfortunate, the unfortunate truth of it is there's there's no way around it. There's no one out there that's uh, looking to help. Um, the state's trying, but you know government works. It's going to move really slowly, um, but. Uh, for those folks that are really in a bad spot as a whole, as an association, uh, we've seen, uh, we work with a couple of bankers. Uh, they've offered uh, quick closing lines of credit and things like that to bolster the reserves, 
to avoid having to raise dues and things like that, but that comes with interest. You know, yeah, you can spread it out over time and it helps you in the now, uh, maybe give you some time for the rates to level out, but uh, the short answer is unfortunately not. Okay, Alan has his hand raised. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, just, I wanted to thank every, uh, thank you guys too for uh, this opportunity to learn more about uh, something that's definitely uh, hurting our community as well. But I have I have two questions uh, unrelated. But the first one was uh, this is the second year in a row that our insurance agent gave us ten days uh, from receipt of proposal. I don't know if that's common with everybody else, but we had a very short fuse in which to make a decision the second year in a row. And the agent just came back and said, well, the insurance companies aren't giving us uh, the proposal. So there's really not, you had talked about shopping and with a limited time frame and a window, there's really not a lot of shopping that you can do. So I wondered if you could talk to, you know, the reason if that is a thing or if it was just something that happened to us, if the time frames, uh, you know, can be elongated or uh, is that common for like a short window, less time, less opportunity to shop. So that's one question. And then the second question I had was, <clears throat> um, in the years, you talked about the years where, you know, the insurance companies were taking a lot of cash and not paying a lot out. So the, the industry looked good before the hurricanes hit. So <clears throat> those profits that were being taken out, can you talk to how those monies were invested? Uh, you know, presumably the insurance company is going to invest funds in such a way that their reserves are built up to handle storms when they hit. So... I just wondered if you could, you know, just talk, uh, if somebody could just talk to those two. Um, uh, so, uh, so reserves were healthy, yes, into the second one for you. Uh, we had 50, well, Ian alone was $52 billion in losses. So those reserves went, you can buy uh, pretty quickly. And as Kevin mentioned earlier, those insurance carriers that insure us here in Florida, they have to purchase insurance. So once they take these huge hits, those hits are passed through to the companies that insure the insurance companies. So then those insurance companies that are insuring insurance companies, they raise their rates. So they're seeing increases similar to the ones we're seeing, which get passed directly down to us as the consumer. So while the reserves were healthy, they went away very quick and investing them for a profit kind of went away with that because they're worried about paying for their, their insurance renewal. So their reserve requirements go up. So they have less free flowing cash because they've got a plan for their next insurance renewal. It, it's, it was the perfect storm, <laughs> essentially, no pun intended. Yeah. And then uh, as far as as far as the timing is concerned, is um, that that has become a problem. You know, we I know Jared and I strive to try to get some sort of initial uh, proposal out further in advance than like 10 days. Um, but, you know, what what we're seeing and, and the problem is, is uh, historically insurance companies have been required to get proposals or quotes out to agents uh, in a more timely manner, uh, we'll say 30 days in advance. Well, that's great. You know, we can at least give you the initial, whoever it is insuring you, here's what they're proposing 30 days in advance. Well, the workaround uh, to that is a lot of the insurance companies are now issuing uh, notices of non-renewal. Even if they plan to renew you, they're issuing notices of non-renewal. And what that does is that gives them a workaround for uh, being able to give you the quotes later or give your agent the quotes later. And as you get closer to the uh, deadline, um, you know, I, I know I know we still strive to uh, try to get things out sooner uh, than, than that. But the reality of the situation is every situation is different. And uh, and, and we unfortunately have had those situations, too, where. Uh, you know, there's uh, a community that, um, you know, they had a non-renewal letter. Uh, they may not be overly marketable to, uh, a, a, you know, a wide array of, of carriers. Uh, and unfortunately, like the excess and surplus lines carriers, 
Uh, they they really don't care about the timing. They're worldwide, uh, you know, insurers. And so, you know, if they're if they're getting in there and and um, trying to provide a proposal or a quote, uh, you know, they may give you something two days before the renewal date. Um, and, and at that point, it's like, you know, here you go. Like th this is when they provided it because they're waiting till the last minute to see where they can where they can put their uh, you know their risk to make the most money and uh, to take the least amount of risk possible. So they're playing that for almost like a uh, horse trading game all the time, all year long. So um, I wish it wasn't the case, but uh, you know, I, as, as agents, I know that Jared and I would, would much prefer to have quotes and proposals out to people 30 or 45 days in advance. Uh, it's stressful for us when it comes down to the wire. Um, you know, I, I know that um, there are some agents out there that play certain games where, you know, they, they leave you with, uh, with a short period of time so you can't shop. But those agents out there are few and far between. I'd like to think, you know, from a standpoint of just having uh, some sort of uh, level of, um, you know, respect for everybody that's out there doing the job. I, I'd like to think that most are um, have integrity about them and would would provide it as soon as it's available. But I know that that's not always the case. And, and I think it's important too, just to bring that up about a notice of non renewal. Um, you know, as a cam. When I get a notice of non-renewal, the first thing I do is forward that to the agent or the broker because they may not know. Um, and, and so I forward that. And, and it's something that if you and sometimes board members receive that in the mail. But it's also something that if your CAM says to you, oh, we got a notice of non-renewal. First thing you should ask that CAM is, have you sent it to the agent? Because you want to make sure the agent starts preparing to shop that around, because if the if renewal is not an option, they they also need as much time as possible. So I think I, I think I'm right on that, Kevin and Jared, right? Yeah. yeah. We it's become such a problem that Kevin and I have made some pretty serious changes to our our systems over here and how we go about communicating with our clients uh, to make them or to make sure they're aware that we start working on these accounts four to five months in advance of the renewal. Uh, doesn't matter these days how early we start other than making sure that we're very prepared to approach every available market doesn't change the timing on their end but what we've been doing to give our clients peace of mind is like kevin mentioned earlier if we've got everything in we've got your general liability your crime your dno your umbrella but we're waiting on property options maybe you've got non-renewed by your current property carrier we're searching for other options. We know from experience, those options are gonna come in late. They're gonna come in relatively last minute. You're gonna know that, or we want you to know that. We're gonna send you a preliminary proposal. Here's what we have so far. Here's your market summary and the carrier responses on the property side so far. So you know that it's being worked on and we're thinking about you. You're not just sitting there, Alan, thinking, are they gonna get us a darn quote? We're a week out. How, how are we going to make a decision? We want you to know, here's the 20 carriers we went to, and here's their responses so far. These five declined because you're built in 1973 and you have aluminum wiring, or this group declined because your roof is over 15 years old. We want you to have something to chew on and take back to your board and your residents, especially, uh, so you're not taking the beating uh, or not you're not sitting there in front of folks without having some realistic responses, you know, and, and, and that's helped. It's not ideal, but that's, that's helped people feel a little bit more comfortable. So do, ask your agents for those market summaries early on. I know you yep. don't have a quote, Mr. Agent, but send me what you've done so far. I think that's a good practice. And, and I have, uh, before you, I know you guys have to go in about 10 minutes. So I got one more question that I want you to just um, talk about. Um, and I, I, and Dean, I also have a question in the chat, so go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I saw that question in the chat okay. too. And I think, okay. uh, you know, I think I could even maybe st stretch on that one um, because okay. yeah, Perfect. I think the answer on that, we have a question in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question first. And I think that I'm right on this. 
has the lack of construction workers that have left our state due to fear of retaliation on their immigration status been a factor on the insurance increase? Well, yes, um, because in, it has increased the construction costs, which is exactly what those guys were talking about. So any increase in costs um, are going to increase your insurance because it costs more to replace something than it costs more to insure it. Am, am I wrong on that? It's, it's definitely driving the replacement cost values. Yep. And then my the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, roof age. Because, you know, we and, and we touched on this briefly yesterday, and I think that it's important for board members to understand that um, I might have a roof on my condo that's, that's you know, tile, and it's it, it's got a 55-year lifespan, and you might have one that's a 20-year shingle on yours, but guess what? After 15 years, what does it matter, Kevin and Jared? <laughs> Matters nothing. Yeah. Nothing. And that's really frustrating because when you when when you put a nice roof on or something like that, but it but it's important for board members to remember that even if you paid extra for that 50 plus year roof that they said, oh, yeah, this will roof will last 50 years at this point in time. And it might change in the near future. But at this point in time, your insurance carrier does not care. They only care about age. And what's right. the age they're looking at replacement, guys, generally? 12 to 15 12 to 15 years. Yeah, you're you're relatively safe at 15 or less. Uh, there's two admitted, <coughs> excuse me, well, one in particular, Heritage Insurance, that they're they're among the most competitive carriers pricing and terms wise in the state. They're admitted to the state of Florida as well. They have a hard stop at 12 years. If you're any older than if you're 12 years or older, they won't even look at your account. And that's a that's a problem because from there. Generally speaking, you're going to be stuck with the excess and surplus lines market, those big global carriers, and there is no, uh, uh, how do I put it, uh, no cap, to put it simply, on what they can charge, which is a necessary evil, because in a lot of cases, there's communities that we've got, especially the bigger condos that are a little bit older age-wise with older roofs, that they would be without coverage altogether without the ENS market. Yeah, and uh, and and so like you may start to see that uh, Jared mentioned earlier actual cash value uh, endorsements and like so let's say you know some of those carriers that have the hard stop at twelve or fifteen years they may write they may write you but they may be on an actual cash value basis for the for the roof if they even provide it but because there's so many people out there that are willing they that need insurance they're trying to pick the best of the best. So they may just outright, you know, decline that um, in order to uh, to get somebody else that has under a 12 year old roof, but, but you're exactly right. So, I mean, if you're, and I had that conversation with somebody today that was looking at a metal roof versus a shingle. And, and I use that same phrase, uh, Dean, as of, as it stands today, um, it doesn't matter. So, uh, you know, even if you have, it, it'd be better, you'd be better off replacing it every 15 years than having, you know, a, a metal roof that lasts 50 um, and just replacing that shingle every 15 years. Now that doesn't, that doesn't take the place of the, the metal roof, maybe the look you want, but that's another uh, aesthetic question that you, you know, you and the board and the members would have to make, a, a, you know, and take into consideration. And, and I have one more question before you guys go, and and uh, I know I know that I know you guys have another com um, a commitment. Um, insurance appraisals, how important, how often, and what what can it make a difference? So uh, if you're a condo, a seven eighteen condo, the statute requires you to to get a new appraisal every three years. That's part of your fiduciary board uh, duty as a, a condo board member. Um, nobody's coming knocking on your door from the state asking where it is or did you get it updated, but in the event of a large claim, uh, your insurance appraisal sets your property insurance limit of coverage. If in the event of a, a, a minor claim or a large claim of, say, a couple hundred thousand dollars for a roof, if at the time of the claim, the insurance uh, adjuster in the company uh, determines that your replacement cost limit on your policy based on the appraisal is low, they will apply what's called a coinsurance penalty and they will chop a portion of that payout off. You'll okay. get paid out less if your 
values are incorrect. So for you board members, especially condo board members, it's important that you do update those appraisals, even though we're not going to like the increase in value. If the claim is paid out uh, short, if you don't get paid enough to replace that roof because you didn't get a new appraisal, who's going to get blamed? It's going to be the board. It's going to be the property manager. You're going to have a DNO claim on your hands. You're going to be sued. And, and you know, we're in Florida, so let's just assume you're going to be sued, even though they're suing their own community. It's, you know, that's what's going to occur. So to answer your question, very important. And every three years for condos, for HOAs, it's not required by the state. But if you've got amenities, a big clubhouse, a pool, a bunch of fancy entry features, guardhouse, things like that, it would be smart to get an appraisal because you could be working with values from 10 years ago and not know it. Right. That's, that's the problem. Who knows where? who determined those values? If you're an HOA, you don't have an appraisal to lean on. If the third party appraiser is, is wrong, that's on him or her. You're passing that liability off to them. If you're a if you get a new appraisal right on time and you match your insurance values to that updated appraisal done by a professional appraiser and they're wrong at the time of a claim, then it's no longer the board's fault. It's the appraiser's fault. Awesome. And, and, and we do, we do recommend for like our townhome communities that insure like condos, even though they're not mandated by a uh, state statute, that 718 that Jared mentioned, we recommend that they follow that. They're insuring like condos, follow the appraisal regulations like a condo. Yep. Awesome. Well, I know you guys have to go, but I appreciate you coming in and joining us and uh... thanks you guys. Oh, thank you for having us. We we really appreciate it. Great group, and uh, let us know if any other questions come up from the from the discussion. Absolutely, and uh, and and I will make sure that um, in the that that Jennifer that you share maybe share contact information for those guys so if they have any follow up questions. Okay. Um, but 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 as soon as these guys go, we're going to talk about what we all came here to talk about, and that is how are we going to pay for this. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for being here. Well, thank you. you. Have a good meeting. Have, have a great evening. All right. So I'm just going to ask around, um, you know, we'll just go around. Uh, uh, how many of you, by a show of hands, um, are considering a raise in your insurance 10 percent? 20 percent. Oh, OK. You, you're you're considering. No, I, when I get to when I get to the point, Rebecca, raise your hand. So you're saying 10 percent. OK, 10 percent. 20%. So we don't, I, I don't know exactly off percentages, but I can tell you what we did as a community because we just had right. a budget meeting. So one thing, we are going to have to have a, a increase in our, in our monthly assessments. We, we already right. knew that. Uh, so it was very important for me to be as transparent about that as possible, as far as the reasons why. We had a community-wide meeting this past Saturday where we kind of went line by line about the proposed budget and you know, explaining about inflation and how the cost of everything is going up. And of course, the big elephant in the room was the insurance. Now, prior to that meeting, I did some due diligence uh, reaching out to our, our vendors, you know, regarding, you know, what their renewals were looking like, you know, what, what would it cost us uh, for renewal? Uh, we are shopping around a little bit too. Uh, one of those calls was to our insurance broker. And, you know, she's been really great about, you know, sort of giving us the lay of the land and what we can expect to see. And, as, and I'm someone who does not work in speculation so much as like I don't want I don't want guesswork. I need I need some numbers. I need a range. I need something. So Rebecca, while can I, can I stop you and ask you one question? Yes. Just, just so we're on the or all we're all understanding on the same page. Are you yeah. a condo association or an HOA? We are a condo association. Okay, perfect. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> while <laughs> while I was having that conversation See, I actually, I don't, I don't handle money or anything, but I work for a financial advisory firm. So okay. I was looking at, you know, historically where the numbers were, where they were, where they were trending. 
and I passed off, you know, what I was seeing uh, and the background information to a couple other friends of mine who, who, you know, look at that kind of stuff as well. And I said, okay, this is, you know, what I'm seeing. Am I correct? This is where I think it's trending. Am I correct? And they were able to confirm that for me, which really only enriched the conversations I was already having. Um, and so when I was talking to our insurance broker, because I, I, I wanted to be able to get as much insight as possible for the budget meeting with the community so they can understand the methodology as much uh, behind the numbers, as much as the conclusions and, and you know, every, I wanted them to, re to really break it down, but in ways that they would understand, not as a financial individual and what's, what's unavoidable, what we're still playing with, what we're seeing and how it's going to impact them. And we were also very, you know, transparent in the fact that we're homeowners too. We are part of the community. So what impacts them also impacts us. And so uh, my insurance broker was really great. We had a really, you know, substantive meaty conversation, just going into all the things. And she was able to give me a number. She's like, I'm comfortable giving you this number. And this is my reasoning behind this number. And what was great about it was she was able to be specific to our community because she's been working with us for a number of years. And so she understood us, you know, and where we are and where she thinks we're going. And we had, of course, other factors to consider in the budget as well. Well, Rebecca, I, I first off, I hand I have to hand it to you for be getting the getting the community involved and getting them. But when is your fiscal year? Is it is it the first of the year, or do you have an odd fiscal year? No, it's all, it's it's the fiscal year. So did you did you go to my talk at the at the mayor's summit? Because it sounds like you did, because you got them involved early, and and you, I mean... and you that was awesome. <laughs> That's what you to see. Yes, I was at your talk. I mean, I was. I I think it's important, be, and this was something that our our board never never really did before. Um, so that when I became president, I immediately started making changes, and part of that was because I, I've been with my company over twenty one years at this point, and while I don't handle the money and I don't handle the deals and all the things, I you pick up a lot by osmosis, right? Sure. So. So I was like, we can't just be talking about the budget come November, December. We need to be having these conversations all Early. year long. We need to yep. be having these conversations earlier when it comes to the next year's budget. We need to have a five-year plan. Like where, where is our uh, assessment, you know, appraisal of, of, you know, do we have enough m money in reserves? We do not. We, you know, when was the last time we had that study done? You know, we need to, we need to have another one because my whole thing is I, I basically in, in looking at the numbers, when, when saying to the two friends of mine that I was talking to, I said, I, we're trending like this and this is where the numbers are. This is where they're going. We can be in a lot of trouble in like less than five years. And I, what I need to, I think we are not yet at the point of no return, but we're heading that direction. I think if we start course correcting now in increments, we can avoid that. Right. And they, they absolutely agreed with me. Well, I, so so back to, back to the question though, um, how much did you increase your line item for insurance? So, what had been what how it was trending was the past two years we we had a big shortfall when it came to the insurance um this year if things stay on track because again we have not approved the budget yet we're still you know tweaking and we just did, we did a preliminary budget meeting okay. uh this past saturday um we were able to meet the number that our insurance broker gave us uh, and what we were able to do it in such a way where we could meet our projected ob obligations, as long as they stay where they are, uh, with only a $25 increase in our assess in, in our fee, 
uh, which was actually an increase that was less. We had an increase last year, but this was less than last year's increase. OK, but you don't remember what the exact uh, percentage point you were thinking of raising the insurance? Um, I, I want to say it was 11 percent. But if you want, I can go look it up real quick. No, that's OK. That's OK. Um, 11 percent. Um, I'm going to be honest with everyone. You know, I I, I manage 17 communities. Um, four of them are condos. Uh, I wouldn't recommend anything below 40 to 60 percent. Mm -hmm. I know that like a lot, but but honestly, um, when I had my conversation with those two knuckleheads from Siley Insurance yesterday, uh, one of the things that they said is, well, we're telling people 60 to 80 percent. I'm like, well, I mean, I the line, so when I say 11 percent, I'm talking about 11 percent increase in our Overall. fee. Yes. I got you. Yeah, I got you. Uh, that's why. That's why I was asking you specifically what the insurance was. Um, it's a it's a lion's share. Yeah. Oh, of course it is. Of course it is. Now, some of the things that you can do. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, and it really doesn't come into play very much. And you you certainly hope that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But do you know that for Florida seven Florida statute seven eighteen? Um, do you, does anyone know how high you can raise a condominiums? Um, um, fees without uh, without an approval from the membership. It's one hundred and fifteen percent. One hundred and fifteen percent. That's what you can raise a condo fee without member assent. The board can do it alone. And as of the Glitch Act, um, which was State Bill one fifty four, which was signed, uh, I believe, in June, um, insurance premiums do not come into that equation. Mm -hmm. So. Literally, you know, and, and that's scary that we have to think, but, but, you know, I don't think it's ever going to get that bad, but I don't have a crystal ball. So I can't tell you how bad it's going to get. And what the guys were saying, you know, anything that brings down insurance premiums takes time. It's almost like a trickle down thing. You know, they eliminate some of the waste. They eliminate some of the abuse. It takes a while for that to actually reach out to us as, as condominiums um, and, and HOA uh, board members um, it, 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 it's not going to, you know, they're saying a year and a half, I'm going to say two to three years before we start seeing a real difference. And that is if we really get some changes in Tallahassee, because really we need this addressed and we need this addressed fast. And hopefully that'll happen. Um, uh, actually, what I'm said, looking that, at the comments and our, our property manager is actually on this call. It's uh, uh -huh. 26%. Okay. 26%. Perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, to answer your question, Carlotta, yes, that increases annually for condominiums. That is how much that you are allowed as a board, and that is according to Florida Statute 718. Now, your documents could be different, um, and that's something Leslie's pointing out. Your documents could be different, um, but if the documents are silent, which in most older condos they are, um, that is the limit. And the insurance premium and anything that you're putting in your reserves are not are not in that equation. Um, so, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm recommending. And again, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm recommending to the boards that I'm working with 40 to 60%, um, just to make sure that you do not get hit or blindsided next year. And it also depends on when are you renewing? If you're renewing in February, it might not be as bad, but, or maybe if you're renewing in, in, in uh, November of next year, it might not be as bad, but nobody has a crystal ball. Um, the other thing that I want you to do um, that you know, I want you to take away from this is one of the things that we talked about with uh, the Siley guys. If you have any doubt about your broker and how much they're shopping it around, ask them for the market analysis. It is yours. It is your right to have it. And if they don't give it to you, then something might be wrong. But you really want to get that marketing analysis from your agent because you want to know how, because you might, and, and the thing is, you might need an explanation. You might open that up and see four quotes, and one of them was really cheap. And you're like, why didn't we go with that one? Well, keep in mind, your insurance agent doesn't make a whole lot of money off of the difference between, you know, $10,000 and $5,000. It really isn't that big of a difference for the agent. Um, so you generally find that the reason they did that is for your own good. I've looked at, I've looked at marketing uh, analysis where, it was 30% of what the actual premium that's being paid, but that 30% came with a 5% deductible and it didn't cover, it covered one named storm per year. That could be a disaster. 
Um, these are things that, that the reason that you have to have a, an agent that you trust is that you really need to ask them these questions. Um, and that's the thing I want to get into, too, is the deductible. Be very careful. A lot of us, will, you're, maybe your agent will say to you, well, it's going to go up $45,000 next year, but if you want to bring your deductible up to 5%, we can probably bring that down to 25,000. You got to be very careful. As I talked about, deductible will come and it will bite you and it will bite you hard financially. Um, the difference between a 1% or 2% deductible and a 5% deductible is a world of difference, especially when you consider what that deductible is. And if there's nothing else that you take when I'm talking about deductibles, and that is this. We are not talking about a $1,000 deductible per occurrence for you know something that might happen. We are talking about the deductible on your property insurance that is two to 5%, well, one to 5% of what your property is worth. And believe it or not, a lot of people live in condominiums, especially, and they don't even know what their property is worth because you just own the air inside your unit. But when you start looking at the, the property at large, you, you might be talking millions and millions of dollars and not what you think, not not a million five, two million. Um, it, it's shocking to most people. So educate yourself and understand um, and ask your agent, well, what, what is what is the difference? Because you really have to do it. If you're looking at raising your deductible to bring down your premium, you've got to make sure, number one, are your, are your um, residents going to be able to handle a very, very large special assessment if there is a total loss, because in my case with 54 people, um, it would cost about $1.5 million to replace the roof that we had, but I'm going to have, you know, we're going to have to come up with the first $470,000 divide that among 54 people that hurts a lot. Um, because again, we, we aren't a high end condo, you know, we're working class people. These are $300,000 condos, um, at the most. So, you know, it, it's going to hurt. Um, so you got to look at your community as a, as a community leader and go, can we handle this? Because ultimately, some people are going to get hurt more than others. Um, but but it's you that they're going to look to for answers when that happens. So you've got to make sure that when you're shopping it around, you understand what you're buying from your insurance agent. Understand that deductible inside and out. Understand what's covered. And, and if you don't understand it, that's what they're there for. Um, but there's certain there are pitfalls when they give you that bargain policy. I really want you to take that apart. I maybe even want to run it by your attorney, because when you start looking at a cut rate policy that covers one name storm a year, that covers that has a five percent deductible and has maybe all kinds of disclaimers and, and and exclusions, that might be trouble in the making. Um, so that's about the policy. Now, as far as paying for the policy, now let's say. You're a smaller community and you've got, you know, you, you only have uh, $130,000 in your operating account. And my God, your bill just came in from the insurance company. It's $70,000. Well, you, you don't want to drain your, your, you don't want to drain your operating account just to pay the insurance. Most policies can be financed. I know I'm the same as you. I don't want to finance anything that I don't have to, because I don't want to pay interest. But sometimes it makes more sense to finance that amount so you know how much you're paying and you know how much it's going to be. And it's much easier to budget month to month. Um, most, most carriers do offer that. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, a stopgap measure. Let's say your insurance goes up uh, $40,000 and you're a much smaller community and you're like, well, you know, we don't have the money to pay this. We don't even have it in our operating account. Well, you might have to consider a special assessment at that point. And again, they're not ideal. No one likes special assessments, but these are, this is the reality. Um, and I've talked enough. So I want to hear what you guys think or what you've done and, and, and the ideas that you have. Nobody? You're going <laughs> to let this guy, you're gonna let this guy be the expert in this <laughs> Do, do you not? I, I know personally with my own condo association, I think we did what you were talking about, where we found out that X policy cost X amount of dollars, Y policy cost Y amount of dollars, 
Z cost Z amount of dollars. And so we we made a decision based on that. So that must have been that market market um, analysis. Yep. Analysis that you were talking about. And so that was helpful. Yeah, it is very helpful. And and you you and again. As long as you understand what it means, you know, we're not insurance experts. That's why we're all here. We're talking about something that we, we're just trying to share our knowledge. Um, you know, when you get that marketing analysis, it'll show you what's covered and what isn't. And it's generally done in a spreadsheet. So it's very easy to figure out. Um, but again, I can't I can't say this enough. Be careful of that deductible. That deductible doesn't sound like much when it's a couple of points. But my God, in dollars, it, it's a lot. Yeah. And I, I, I think I think that the whole point, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Alan, but I think my personal view too is when you can afford it, pay for stuff before it happens instead of getting that assessment afterwards, because that's that's where it hurts. I'm sorry, Alan, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say um we uh we did have a 10 day window and I talked to, I worked with six insurance companies in 10 days, six agents. And ironically, I ended up with Kevin over who was just on the call. I like, yeah. Uh, but, but we, we ended up trying to reduce the, the cost, but what I really found out, uh, Dean was that we had a really crappy policy. So, so what I learned was I, I got, I, I got a much better policy for about the same amount of increase that I was paying on a lousy policy. And when I got on the board, that policy had been in place already for like 12 years. So nobody had ever gone back and evaluated it. It just got carried along. So it was yep. kind of a good opportunity to get a better policy. We, we couldn't beat the increase. So we just passed on, we raised our monthly to pass on the cost to cover the Delta between what we were paying and it went up a hundred percent. So we just passed that on in a, in, in a monthly, we're a small community. So. And the age Kevin said, you know, it'll probably be the same next year or a little bit more. So we didn't plan ahead, as you had suggested, by doing a huge increase. We just wanted to cover the delta, and then next year we'll figure out what's going. I mean, if we have another big increase, we'll either have to raise the dues. We borrowed a little bit from our reserves, and then we're paying it back with the money that we're extra money that we're taking in every month. So we're just taking it year to year right now. That's a that's a really good point. James Wood is on the call is on this with us, and he's on the he serves on my board with me. Um, and one of the things he was on the board longer than I've been, and um, we had an on site manager that was supposedly shopping us around, but then we brought in an insurance expert. Um, and I don't know if it was Kevin or Jared or one. I don't even think those guys handle my insurance, but um, they said, "Yeah, man, we looked at your policy." And I don't even remember, Jim, we were only covered for one name storm a year. And it was That's like right. really crazy things. And and we were devastated by Irma. Irma cost us our roof. We had to, we had to, we ended up having to get a new roof after Irma. And had there been another storm after Irma, I don't know what would have happened. But we were only covered for one name storm per year. So it's very important, Alan. That's a good point is if you don't feel comfortable with your agent or you don't feel like you have the right kind of coverage, bring somebody else in. Even if you don't care to change, bring somebody else in anyway. Say, hey man, here's my policy. Take a look at it and tell me what you think you can do for me. Because I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And, and that, lead, that leads to the point too that we sometimes say in our office, just when we're handling our policies on how we handle our events is that you don't need to do the same old thing just because that's how you've always done it right. nor do you make and maybe you don't you, you shouldn't want to either right. so it's a good thing that you probably checked around yeah, yeah i mean you, and, and you probably were shocked alan you were shocked you're like i thought i thought we just had you know because like with us, we just kept renewing the same policy, the same policy. Then it might change carriers, but, you know, it was still the same policy. And then we realized, my God, we didn't have much of a policy at all. You know, I remember, I think, uh, I think when my very first job, um, I had a, I had the medical insurance that came with my first job. I was paying $16. Well, I'm going to age myself. I was paying $16 a month. And I think the cap on it was $250. So I started doing the math going, wait a minute, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, 
you know, you, you keep doing the same thing, doing the same thing. And sometimes it's good. You know, and again, you're, if your insurance agent feels uncomfortable with you bringing in another agent to look at your policy, you probably need a new insurance agent. Yeah, this started, this started, started me, Dean, uh, re, 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 uh, uh, every year redone my auto insurance, homeowner's insurance. I switched to uh, homeowner's insurance last year and then Universal went out of business. And I thought, well, I did a good thing by picking somebody else this time. But the, uh, the, the difference was, is that, uh, finding out what they were really covering and, uh, and like we did with, uh, with our homeowner's insurance on the buildings. And, uh, and we found it, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, it's full of holes. Didn't, yeah. It didn't have us covered worth of crap. And, uh, that's not a good thing. You only get what you pay for. So you really need to look hard at what, what you're going to, possibilities are going to be out there that can happen to you in your community before you, and then shop it, just like Dean said. If you shop it, and, uh, and you know, if you just consider the fact that the, that if they just reconfirm by shopping it, that you got a decent policy, then you're okay. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that's the best, that's the best case scenario. You pat yourself on the back and you go, hey, I did a great job. I got a good policy. Um, but it, but it, it is very important. And, and you, you know, ask the questions. And, and also understand that it's very hard for insurance agents to give you an apples to apples comparison. It's very hard. Every age, every carrier is different. There's going to be pros and cons. Even if you have two nearly identical policies, you're going to find one that's going to work better for you, um, even though they might cost the exact same. There might be different exemptions and different, you know, things about it that are better for you. Um, but it, it's hard to to do an apples to apples comparison. One of the things I found out, Dean, when when I when I did ours and I evaluated it, the uh, the original square footage that we were paying for, uh, you know, this was done before I got on the board. It was totally incorrect. I got yep. off. The, Jim, I got Jim off did the same wheel, thing. My wheel thing. I measured it all, and I went. All right, well, if we're going to switch policies, I want to make sure that the square footage is accurate. And it was completely inaccurate. I have absolutely no idea who screwed that up, whether it was the agent or whether it was the appraisal done two decades ago. But we were, you know, had we actually had a catastrophic uh, issue, the insurance company probably would have had a way out of, uh, uh, you know, paying on some of those because the square footages were hugely incorrect. Well, you know, we had the same thing and Jim was actually um, was going around with the uh, with the appraiser going, no, he's not doing this right. The buildings are not are they're not the right size. And I kept saying, Jim, stop it. You're costing us more money. <laughs> but at the end of the day, he was 100 percent right, because yeah. exactly if there if we were to have a total loss and we were short, you know, 15, 1500 square feet, even on the entire complex, that's a lot of money. So yes, it is very important to make sure that when you get those insurance appraisals that your square footage is right. Um, make sure they have the plats. Make sure they walk the buildings because plats change. And Jim, you found that. That's, that's true. I did. Yep. And it was so important that uh, we squared things up, including with uh, a couple owners that, that it almost looked like they were paying more in, uh, in property taxes because of the wrong amount being uh, on, on their condos. Some, some were paying less. But it had to be or it had to be evened out. So yeah, so he's got a couple of people that are really happy with him, a couple of people very upset with him. But you know, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> like other, well, go other ahead. questions? Yeah, uh, that's what I was gonna say. If there's any more questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Or any other input. Um yeah. I know yeah, a lot of times pe people people just want to be able to say, here's my situation, and I wish somebody could give me an answer to my situation. And unfortunately, sometimes we're not able to give you that solution. We can just tell you what each of us did. Yeah, I was you know, wondering about the legislation in Tallahassee. I haven't really gotten involved in that, but they kind of touched on that. You know, what... What kind of protections are being put in place to to prevent this from happening every year? Because we all well, know I mean, we, our, our insurance rates double every year. You know, it's like uh, Rebecca had said. At some point, we're we're in serious trouble. You know. Well, they gave you the idea. They the 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 two knuckleheads that were here. They they gave you their side. I'm going to give you the other side. Okay. Okay. From the from the the homeowner board member 
John Q. Public side. Um, the way they are trying to bring down the um, premiums is by doing away with what we talked about. There's lots of fraud and there's lots of litigation. So they got rid of the multiplier, okay, which, which I think is fair. You know, it, the, the idea that if your agent, that if your, your, um, your lawyer wins a case, they get three times their fees back from the insurance company because they acted in bad faith. Um, I don't think that's a good penalty, and I'm glad they got rid of that. But what they did do, and they made it so that if you do have a loss and your insurance company says, I, I'm not going to pay that. I'm sorry, but we don't we don't think that that's our responsibility. Um, and you sue them and lose, you are responsible for your own legal fees. And I'm going to tell you in, in no uncertain terms, that sucks. Because now people like you and I, um, are having to fight very, very large insurance companies. So, you know, I think that that what we need to do as board members and as homeowners and, and everything is to make sure all our ducks in a row. Don't give that insurance company any reason whatsoever to say, we're not going to cover that claim. You didn't put in fire extinguishers. You didn't do an appraisal. You Make sure you've got all your ducks in a row because they will. 100% deny your claim on anything. And unfortunately, it's going to make it very difficult for us to come back at them and go, no, you're wrong. And honestly, what's happening too is the insurance agents or the um, attorneys that used to jump on these cases, they won't even return your phone call anymore for that same reason. They're saying, well, I'm not going to take that on. Um, and we had a gentleman, it's listed Karen Wheeler. Did you, you had a question, you raised your hand? Oh, we can't hear you. You gotta, you gotta unmute. You gotta take, you gotta take yourself off mute. Can you take him off mute, Jennifer? I'm. Tr let me see if I can do that. Hang on. Yeah, she might be able to take you off mute right here. Mm, I don't think I'm able to do that. Okay. How about now? Yes. Okay, there you go. Yep, there you go. It's Mike, Perfect. That's Mike. This is Mike Flynn from okay, Dover Mike. Green. Uh, I'm with Dover Green Condominiums. Uh, one of the things that you you have covered both, you know, the appraisal of uh, condominiums and the increase of uh, of the insurance rates and everything else. One of the hidden costs for us is when we had put a new roof on, we had we had put a 40-year architectural, architectural shingle on there. Uh, and we, for the life of that loan or whatever, uh, we, didn't, we didn't do it for 15 years. Because we put a better shingle on, we had said 20, 25 years. So that's, that's going to be a hidden cost for us because yep. now we're going to have to accelerate what what the uh, what the roof is in order to replace the the roof and have the insurance companies cover us. We did the same thing. We replaced our roof with a uh, with a concrete concrete tile roof. Um, we were told that it was going to be forty five to fifty five years. We took a loan because we didn't make enough off the insurance proceeds from the Irma damage, mm -hmm. and we still have. Nine years left on that loan, and our and our um, roof is 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 uh, five years old. So we're right at that limit. You know, we're right at that limit, and 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 I, you know, I, I we're not as bad as you because you you stretched out the loan a little bit further. But yeah, and the, unfortunately, the insurance companies don't care. They don't care that you put an architecturally structural roof, and, and or I could have put tar paper on mine. It wouldn't have made any difference because in 15 years, they're going to not insure me because I'm, I don't have a new roof. And hopefully, and that's one of the things they were saying, that the le the legislation might be changing on that. That that might be, there might be some hope in that. And I hope so, because I'd hate to look like that guy that convinced the community to put in the best we could put in and find out that the insurance company doesn't even care. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh thank you for sharing that. Kathy Curry, do you have a question? Yeah, Same actually, question. I have one question, but this conversation just brought up something else to me. So based on 
uh, what the insurance, what your insurance coverage is going to be. Um, are you recommending that we change that number in the reserve calculation so that we aren't basing it on the replacement cost and instead we're replacing the roof on the insurance coverage cost? You know, that's a very good question. I am not a reserve um, specialist, but realistically, yes. Realistically, you should probably be talking to whoever did your reserve study and, and bringing this up because, um, yeah, it is very important. And, and you know, we're, we're not, our reserve says that our roof has another 30 some years left to it. But guess what? If we had to shop for a new insurance or my insurance, if this, if the legislation doesn't change, could realistically say, nope, they won't even quote you because you don't have a new roof or it's going to, our premium is going to be enormous because they're going to put a surcharge or as he explained, replacement cost, which means they'll pay for the cost of the roof, but they're going to take out the depreciation. And, you know, and again, that on top of the deductible, what are they going to actually pay for? You know, right. they're not going to pay for much of anything, yeah. but that's a very good point, Kathy. Um, my other thing, and I cannot find my notes right now, but, um, a couple of months ago, I shared some information with my board that um, there's a, and I think that it was based on that there's a difference in um, the reimbursement or the deductible versus um, like a hurricane versus a tornado um, or a tropical storm. So if you, um, if if there was a hurricane forecasted oh, and um, it's downgraded to a tropical storm, um, the insurance company is going to calculate the value based on it being the rate of a hurricane. So you're going to get less money back or less payments than you would have if it had been valued at uh, the rate of a tropical storm. Does anyone else remember that? That doesn't ring a bell for me. And I wish we I wish we'd asked that when Kevin and Jared were here, because that would have been a great question for them. But they're, we're going to get their information so we can ask. But yet, no, does anyone else hear anything like that, that you get paid less in your claim if it's a tropical storm versus a hurricane? No, when I when I renewed, you know, I just, uh, you know, we got named storm, you know, sure. we, we had a hurricane. But now we have named storm. So as long as it has a name, they're going to pay. Uh, but no, I, I, I don't recall any conversation about a varying percentage between a named storm and a hurricane. If I if I find that, I'll send it to Jennifer so that it, she can send that out. That there. would be awesome. I, I'd be very interested in seeing that. And that's a really good question. It is a, good, a very good question. I mean, you know, and, and it really, again, these are one of those things and, and it brings up the same point. Make sure that you understand what your insurance policy covers, because I, I, you know, here I am. I deal with insurance all the time, but I did not. I was not able to answer Kathy's question. That would be a question I would reach out to my broker or, or one of my broker friends and go, "Hey, explain this to me." Um, there's so many different insurances out there, and there's so much different coverage that it's really important to understand what you're buying. So is a tropical storm considered a name storm? Yes, it is. Okay. And as soon as as soon as it has a name, even if it gets downgraded, it's still yeah. it's still considered a storm. But but the coverage on it, Marcus, I can't answer for you. I I, I yeah. don't know if it if it varies or not. In our in our old policy, I mean, if if it was a if it was not a hurricane, you know, cat one, two, three, or four, then our insurance wasn't going to pay anything. So if, if it really? was a tropical storm, uh, they wouldn't have paid. Now we have named storm. So as soon as it gets a name and it goes from an investigate this tropical depression to a name, we're covered by our previous policy. We didn't have that and we didn't even know it. So, you know, Dean, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, especially, you know, and, and ours was a legacy insurance policy and everybody trusted the agent. Uh, you know, I, I got a little hot with them when the two years in a row they gave us 10 days to, you know, on the proposal. That's when I really started looking at it. I learned a lot in 10, 10 days. But they're absolutely right. We had a terrible policy, didn't even know it. Yeah, it happens. 
Oh, okay, I've I've just found it online, and this was from the um, uh, um. Let me read this to you first, and then it says uh, Florida is a unique state that is surrounded by water on three sides and is susceptible to hurricanes. Therefore, Florida insurance policies have a unique hurricane deductible to make sure it is applied consistently to all covered windstorm claims resulting from a hurricane. The law is very specific regarding when the hurricane deductible applies, for what duration and how many times the deductible can be applied here. And so it doesn't go any further here, but I'm quite sure that I read something that said, um, What was the source? Um, I'm trying to find that too because I it was um, let me go back here. It was the um, consumer the Florida Consumer Protection uh, website. Now I will definitely be looking into that. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? Yell at me for not knowing that. Anything. I'll take it. <laughs> and, you know, also what you can do is if you think of a question or a comment later tonight or a month from now, please feel free to let me know. And I can, I, 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 I'm going to assume that Dean would be amenable to letting me ask of course him questions <laughs> so if you can't think of something right now that's fine I, I do have one actually i want to ask you dean what did you think of their answer to my question about you know they they, they admitted that they had decades or more of uh you know record profits you know a lot of a lot of revenue coming in and not much going out in the way of claims and my question was you know how is that money invested because typically you know the insurance companies are going their answer was, well, we just use that money to, to buy reinsurance. Uh, so basically, they, I guess I think what it, I understood he was saying is we don't really invest the money that you gave us. So what's your thought? What's your thought on that? Dean? Did that does that you know, sound like a uh, dodge? It, possibly. Um, but at the same time, I'm not an insurance expert. I'm, I've never been trained in insurance, but it's always been my impression. And, and again, this what I'm about to say is my impression is that insurance companies are sort of like boards and associations. They build up money in their reserves so that when they do have to do a huge payout for you know a, an entire state because of something, then that's where the reserves come from. And that's why he referred to the reserves. But as far as investing, I don't know. I do know that when we were going through our, um, when we were fighting our insurance company for our IRMA claim, there were a lot of rumors running around. You'd be surprised how 54 people can just start rumors um, that our insurance carrier was out of money and they were never going to settle because they were going to go bankrupt. And I did a lot of research on the company and it was it was the original company was Aspen and they were a, they were reinsured by another company who ultimately I found that they had like 17 billion dollars in assets. So I'm like, OK. Now I don't know what their investment was or anything on that in the you know the, the 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 mother company if you want to call it of all of this, but I just did find out that there was a lot of money behind that very small, somewhat small carrier, but I don't know how it's invested. I really wish I had an answer for you, Alan, but I don't know. Yeah, because it always bothered me that they they claim that they don't have the money when the storm hits, but you know they right they'll, they'll admit to record profits for ten years with very little payout, so. Why would you? Well, but but then again, you know, you know, one of the figures that I'll always come back to um, is that, you know, Florida represents ten percent of the premiums paid in the country, and 80, 80 to eighty five, I think, percent of the claims that are paid out. So that's got to hurt them a little bit too. But you yeah. know, I, I agree. I don't think I, I don't think it was so much a dodge as it's one of those things that they probably just don't like to talk about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, Karen, you yeah. have you have a question. Yeah. I oh, think you're on mute. Nope, you're muted still. There you go. Okay, try. Nope. No. Nope. nope, muted, but I can't hear you.
Can't hear you. Nope, still can't hear you, Karen. Can you can you type your question in the in the uh, chat? Hey, folks. Uh, this is Dave Stevens. I've got something that is similar to what we're discussing. Uh, so if you've got just a minute, of course. Uh, I, uh, I just went through this with a timeshare that I own properties in and uh, their insurance increased. This is in Longboat Key, by the way, which is shouting different uh, distance from yep. Fort Myers Beach. Yep. Uh, their insurance went from 91K to 181K. Oh, geez. Point blank, which is just about 100%. Yep. For the, the exact same coverage we had. And we did have a good policy, by the way, though. Uh, believe it or not, um, while that is an outlier, it is not unheard of. I'm seeing that also. That is not, I, I out, of, out of the properties that I'm managing, I have one that's gone up 100%. Well, 96%. Um, it's crazy. And and that's why, you know, that's why we're all here. Because it's just, you just don't know. Um, now, let me ask you a question, Dave. Did you... Um, did you ask your agent for a market analysis to find out where that was shopped around? I'm sure you did. Yes, we did. We actually had a market analysis done six months prior. Okay. Yeah. So you knew what you were, you know, yeah, that's, uh, I'm yeah. sorry that happened to you. That's rough. Right. What, well, of course, you're saying this is on Longboat Key. So you're talking about an area that had just been devastated by two storms. Pretty close. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Wow. So how did you how did you finance that? I mean, how did you how uh, did you find that? We Did had a floated team? increase to to all the homeowners. And, and how it, much it, increase was it? I know it's I know it's timeshare. It's a little bit different, but how much? Yeah, it it, it was about a hundred dollars a week for the the timeshare renters. Wow. Wow. Quite yeah, it's pretty expensive. Um, Karen, I don't know if you're still trying to unmute yourself, but um, Dean did also put his email address in the chat section. I'm going to repeat so it now. I, I'm going to put it in what, again. People okay. Know. Or what you can do, Karen, is you can email me and I'll ask your question of Dean. Yep. And you're, st I think you're still on mute. So it may be a situation where you have to go into your settings or something. You know, it's funny, we come into these and, and Jennifer and I talked about it yesterday. So we'll give ourselves two hours. And I, I thought to myself, no, no way. way. There's yeah. no way it will be done in an hour. And yeah. then she get going. You're like, my God, there's so much. I mean, we could probably go on all night about this, but right. it's just, uh, you know, um, and again, I, I want to, I want you, you know, I'm sorry that we don't have answers for you. I wish I could give you a hard, fast answer. If you do this, you're going to be fine. Um, but there, there is no answer out there. I'm just, you know, all we can do is give you the ideas that we've used and, you yeah. know, don't be afraid yeah. to finance it if you have to. Um, but, and make sure that you're constantly looking at what your your agent is offering you. As we've seen the pitfalls of that with Alan, that, uh, you know, sometimes you're getting a policy. And who knows? You might be paying for a policy right now that you've been a legacy policy that you've been going on forever and ever. And next thing you know, boom, you, uh, you know, you find out that you've been paying too much and you're not getting much coverage. So right. it never hurts to have your policies looked at, especially if right. they haven't been chopped around for a couple of years. I'd recommend too, like know when your policy is going to be renewed and call them, be proactive and call them 45 days in advance and yep. say, all right, what's going on? You know, uh, put it on their radar screen that you know that your policy's coming up so they can't sandwich you into a 10 day time frame to make a decision. So, yep, I, that's exactly a good time frame. You, so, get them moving. Yeah, 45 days is actually the time frame I use, too. It's on my Google calendar. If I get up one morning and says, this one is going to be due in 45 days, I know today, I'm going to reach out to the to the uh, agent. Yeah. So, Karen, Karen, just email me tomorrow. 
with your question or your comment and i'm sorry we couldn't yeah i'm sorry about that karen yes. I, I wish i could have gotten to your question We just, we, we just, we can't hear you. Yeah, I, 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 I it's very frustrating because I, I want to hear what she, she obviously has something very important to say, but we'll. Yeah, uh, this, this is Dave Stevens on some, some PCs, you, you've got to hold down the space bar, not just touch it and release it. If you hold it down, it will allow you to speak. She's not coming up with any sound. So I'm wondering if she doesn't have any device plugged in. No, she's not muted. She we we watched her unmute, but we still can't hear her. No, she's got her mic, she's got her mic right there and it's not working. Well, I, I'm sorry to move on, Karen, but we'll, you know, if you please get your question to um to Jennifer and she'll get it to me, or you can email me directly. My email is in the um is in the chat. Anyone else have anything they want to add before we uh, cut everybody loose? I want to make sure we get everybody's questions answered. Well, since nobody's asking one, I'll throw one out there anyway. Uh, All right, Mark. Dean's our property manager, so I didn't want to kind of hijack everyone else's time there. But um, with with the deductibles, those are if it's a hurricane, it's per name storm. So if you had two hurricanes coming in a season, which, you know, isn't unheard of, that would mean it potentially now two deductibles. It depends on how your policy is written. Sometimes okay. you pay one deductible for the, the, the calendar year and you're done. And then the next one pays. And, and that's something that Kevin, uh, Kevin and I talked about the other night. Um, no, but if some, the policy is saying per named storm, then if you had two hurricanes, then it is, you would have to come up with the deductible twice. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I don't know if any idea yeah, that would never even. I mean, I think ours is even worse because it's the build eat. There's three buildings, and each one of them has its own deductible. So yeah, you had two storms hitting all three buildings. That would be a uh, monster deductible that we don't even. But I'm sure it's only deductible on each individual building and not on the whole property. That's that's the correct. Difference. Yeah. Yeah, but still, I mean, but I, the deductible. I think it was. I don't know. I thought it was like five grand, and it went up to seventy-five grand to uh, to keep the premium from skyrocketing. But and yeah. I I think that those figures are about right. I I, yeah. I don't know. I that I, that sounds vaguely familiar because yeah, I, know I think were, last year we couldn't get any estimates, so we just as a swag, I think, did twenty-five percent. Right. And then the thing, I think it went up like a hundred percent. And then we came back and said, if we increase the deductible up to 75 grand, then the premium is now only about 25% increased. <laughs> and so that was within our budget at some point, but yeah, the deductibles now we don't, we don't have a, we don't have that covered. So. Right. And that was 75 K per building, I believe. So it's going to, yeah, 224, $225,000. Now, what, what, what Marcus is talking about, they're a very small community. They're 20, 20 yeah. units. Um, the beautiful, beautiful condominiums right on, right on Lake Cherokee, but, uh, but, but very small community. And the smaller the community, sometimes that, that hurts the more because, you know, yeah, you, you, your, your percentage of, of that or your portion of that, large uh, deductible is is hard to swallow and karen did email me um she said that there was an article in the paper about a month ago that the insurance companies during the good years were paying their executives exorbitant bonuses and salaries and that's where the money went no way i refuse to believe that <laughs> i can't imagine they were doing that i that's blasphemy i'm sure they were i am sure they were um you know it's it's like it just it almost it almost amazes me how how just corporations acting badly you know it's like you you're, you're you do all this and, and and you're so open about oh yeah we're going to give our ceo a 16 billion dollar um parachute when we fire him and it's like oh come on man Right. You're gonna, you're, that I have to pay this amount for your product? Come on. But yeah, it happens. I, I'm sure Karen's right. I'm sure she is. 
I bet you that they were doing living it living large. Um so thank thank you everyone for joining us. And this was, I thought, a pretty um a, a good great conversation. Uh one of the things that I always say in our monthly community connections workshops is that people learn is as much from each other yep. as they do from whoever our presenter is sometimes usually more because I can listen to what Kathy says. I can listen to what Carol says. I can listen to what, um, you know, Joe Smith says, and I can take a little bit of each thing and make it into something that works for me or for my neighborhood. Exactly. So I really appreciate you all um, joining us this evening. And if anybody ever has a topic in the future where they'd like to have this kind of neighborhood discussion, feel free to reach out and let me know and I'll make it happen.